The Abbasid Caliphate or Arabic, Khilafatu Labaziyat al -Khilafatu al was the third of the Islamic caliphates to succeed the Islamic prophet Muhammad. The Abbasid dynasty descended from Muhammad's uncle, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib from whom the dynasty takes its name. They ruled as caliphs for most of the caliphate from their capital in Baghdad in modern-day Iraq. After having overthrown over the Umayyad caliphate in the Abbasid Revolution of 750 CE, 132 AH. The Abbasid caliphate first centered its government in Kufa, modern-day Iraq, but in 762 the caliph Al-Mansur founded the city of Baghdad near the Sasanian capital city of Cte Siphon. The Abbasid period was marked by reliance on Persian bureaucrats notably the Barmakid family for governing the territories conquered by Arab Muslims as well as an increasing inclusion of non-Arab Muslims in the Ummah national community. Persianate customs were broadly adopted by the ruling elite, and they started supporting artists and scholars. Baghdad became a center of science, culture, philosophy and invention in what became known as the Golden Age of Islam. Despite this initial cooperation, the Abbasids of the late 8th century had alienated both non-Arab Mawali clients and Iranian bureaucrats. They were forced to cede authority over Al-Andalus and the Maghreb to the Umayyads in 756, Morocco to the Idrisid dynasty in 788, Ifriqiya to the Aghlabids in 800 and Egypt to the Shiite Caliphate of the Fatimids in 969. The political power of the caliphs largely ended with the rise of the Iranian Bayids and the Seljuk Turks, which each captured Baghdad in 945 and 1055 respectively. Although Abbasid leadership over the vast Islamic empire was gradually reduced to a ceremonial religious function, the dynasty retained control over its Mesopotamian domain. The Abbasids' period of cultural fruition ended in 1258 with the sack of Baghdad by the Mongols under Hulagu Khan. The Abbasid line of rulers, and Muslim culture in general, recentered themselves in the Mamluk capital of Cairo in 1261. Though lacking in political power, the dynasty continued to claim authority in religious matters until after the Ottoman conquest of Egypt in 1517. History <laughs> Abbasid Revolution 750 The Abbasid caliphs were Arabs descended from Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, one of the youngest uncles of Muhammad and of the same Banu Hashim clan. The Abbasids claimed to be the true successors of Prophet Muhammad in replacing the Umayyad descendants of Banu Umayyah by virtue of their closer bloodline to Muhammad. The Abbasids also distinguished themselves from the Umayyads by attacking their moral character and administration in general. According to Ira Lapidus, the Abbasid revolt was supported largely by Arabs, mainly the aggrieved settlers of Merv with the addition of the Yemeni faction and their Mawali. The Abbasids also appealed to non-Arab Muslims, known as Mawali, who remained outside the kinship-based society of the Arabs and were perceived as a lower class within the Umayyad Empire. Muhammad ibn Ali, a great-grandson of Abbas, began to campaign for the return of power to the family of Prophet Muhammad, the Hashemites, in Persia during the reign of Umar II. During the reign of Marwan II, this opposition culminated in the rebellion of Ibrahim the Imam, the fourth in descent from Abbas. Supported by the province of Khorasan, Persia, even though the governor opposed them, and the Shi'i Arabs, he achieved considerable success, but was captured in the year 747 and died, possibly assassinated, in prison. On 9 June 747, 15 Ramadan A 129, Abu Muslim, rising from Khorasan, successfully initiated an open revolt against Umayyad rule, which was carried out under the sign of the Black Standard. Close to 10,000 soldiers were under Abu Muslim's command when the hostilities officially began in Merv. General Kataba followed the fleeing governor Nasser ibn Sayyar West defeating the Umayyads at the Battle of Gorgon, the Battle of Nahavand and finally in the Battle of Karbala, all in the year 748. The quarrel was taken up by Ibrahim's brother Abdallah, known by the name of Abu al-Abbas as Safa, who defeated the Umayyads in 750 in the battle near the Great Zab and was subsequently proclaimed caliph. After this loss, Marwan fled to Egypt, where he was subsequently assassinated. The remainder of his family, barring one male, were also eliminated, immediately after their victory, as Safa sent his forces to Central Asia, where his forces fought against Tang expansion during the Battle of Talas. 
The noble Iranian family Barmakids, who were instrumental in building Baghdad, introduced the world's first recorded paper mill in the city, thus beginning a new era of intellectual rebirth in the Abbasid domain. As Safa focused on putting down numerous rebellions in Syria and Mesopotamia. The Byzantines conducted raids during these early distractions. Topic. Power 752 The first change the Abbasids, under Al-Mansur, made was to move the empire's capital from Damascus, in Syria, to Baghdad in Iraq. This was to both appease as well to be closer to the Persian Mawali support base that existed in this region more influenced by Persian history and culture, and part of the Persian Mawali demand for less Arab dominance in the empire. Baghdad was established on the Tigris River in 762. A new position, that of the vizier, was also established to delegate central authority, and even greater authority was delegated to local emirs. This eventually meant that many Abbasid caliphs were relegated to a more ceremonial role than under the Umayyads, as the viziers began to exert greater influence, and the role of the old Arab aristocracy was slowly replaced by a Persian bureaucracy. During al-Mansur's time control of al-Andalus was lost, and the Shiites revolted and were defeated a year later at the Battle of Bakamra. The Abbasids had depended heavily on the support of Persians in their overthrow of the Umayyads. Abu al-Abbas' successor, al-Mansur welcomed non-Arab Muslims to his court. While this helped integrate Arab and Persian cultures, it alienated many of their Arab supporters, particularly the Khorasanian Arabs who had supported them in their battles against the Umayyads. These fissures in their support led to immediate problems. The Umayyads, while out of power, were not destroyed. The only surviving member of the Umayyad royal family, which had been all but annihilated, ultimately made his way to Spain where he established himself as an independent emir Abd ar -Rahman I, 756. In 929, Abd ar rahman III assumed the title of caliph, establishing al-Andalus from Cordoba as a rival to Baghdad as the legitimate capital of the Islamic Empire. In 756, the Abbasid Caliph al-Mansur sent over 4,000 Arab mercenaries to assist the Chinese Tang dynasty in the Anxi rebellion against Anlushan. The Abbasidis or ''Black Flags'', as they were commonly called, were known in Tang dynasty chronicles as the Hayyidashi, the black-robed Tazi, Hayyidashi, Tazi, being a borrowing from Persian Tazi, the word for ''Arab''. Al-Rashid sent embassies to the Chinese Tang dynasty and established good relations with them. After the war, these embassies remained in China with Caliph Harun al-Rashid establishing an alliance with China. Several embassies from the Abbasid caliphs to the Chinese court have been recorded in the Tang annals, the most important of these being those of Abul Abbas al-Safa, the founder of the Abbasid dynasty, Abu Jafar and Harun al-Rashid. Abbasid Golden Age 775 to 861 The Abbasid leadership had to work hard in the last half of the 8th century 750 to 800 under several competent caliphs and their viziers to overcome the political challenges created by the far-flung nature of the empire and the limited communication across it and usher in the administrative changes needed to keep order it was also during this early period of the dynasty, in particular during the governance of al-Mansur, Harun al-Rashid, and al-Mayman, that the reputation and power of the dynasty was created. Al-Mahdi restarted the fighting with the Byzantines and his sons continued the conflict until Empress Irene pushed for peace. After several years of peace, Nikephoros I broke the treaty, then fended off multiple incursions during the first decade of the 9th century. These attacks pushed into the Taurus Mountains culminating with a victory at the Battle of Krasos and the massive invasion of 806, led by Rashid himself. Rashid's navy also proved successful as he took Cyprus. Eventually, the momentum turned and much of the land gained was lost. Rashid decided to focus on the rebellion of Rafi ibn al-Layth in Khorasan and died while there. While the Byzantine Empire was fighting Abbasid rule in Syria and Anatolia, military operations during this period were minimal, as the caliphate focused on internal matters, its governors exerting greater autonomy and using their increasing power to make their positions hereditary. At the same time, the Abbasids faced challenges closer to home. Harun al Rashid turned on the Barmakids, a Persian family that had grown significantly in power within the administration of the state and killed most of the family. 
During the same period, several factions began either to leave the empire for other lands or to take control of distant parts of the empire away from the Abbasids. The reign of al-Rashid and his sons were considered to be the apex of the Abbasids. After Rashid's death, the empire was split by a civil war between the Caliph al-Amin and his brother al-Mayman who had the support of Khorasan. This war ended with a two-year siege of Baghdad and the eventual death of al-Amin in 813. Al-Mayman ruled for 20 years of relative calm interspersed with a rebellion supported by the Byzantines in Azerbaijan by the Karamites. Al-Mayman was also responsible for the creation of an autonomous Khorasan, and the continued repulsing of Byzantine forays. al mutazm gained power in 833 and his rule marked the end of the strong caliphs. He strengthened his personal army with Turkish mercenaries and promptly restarted the war with the Byzantines. His military excursions were generally successful culminating with a resounding victory in the sack of Amorium. His attempt at seizing Constantinople failed when his fleet was destroyed by a storm. The Byzantines restarted the fighting by sacking Damietta in Egypt. al mutawakkil responded by sending his troops into Anatolia again, sacking and marauding until they were eventually annihilated in 863. Fracture to Autonomous Dynasties 861 Even by 820, the Samanids had begun the process of exercising independent authority in Transoxiana and Greater Khorasan, as had the Shia Hamdanids in northern Syria, and the succeeding Tahirid and Seferid dynasties of Iran. The Seferids, from Khorasan, nearly seized Baghdad in 876, and the Tulunids took control of most of Syria. The trend of weakening of the central power and strengthening of the minor caliphates on the periphery continued, an exception was the ten-year period of al-Mutadid's rule. He brought parts of Egypt, Syria, and Khorasan back into the Abbasids' control. Especially after the "'anarchy at Samarra." The Abbasid central government was weakened and centrifugal tendencies became more prominent in the caliphate's provinces. By the early 10th century, the Abbasids almost lost control of Iraq to various emirs, and the Caliph al-Radi was forced to acknowledge their power by creating the position of ''Prince of Princes'' Amir al-Umara, al mustakfi had a short reign from 944 to 946, and it was during this period that the Persian faction known as the Bayids from Dalam swept into power and assumed control over the bureaucracy in Baghdad. According to the history of Miskawe, they began distributing IQTAS fiefs in the form of tax farms to their supporters. This period of localized secular control was to last nearly 100 years. The loss of Abbasid power to the Bayids would shift as the Seljuks would take over from the Persians. At the end of the 8th century, the Abbasids found they could no longer keep a huge polity larger than that of Rome together from Baghdad. In 793, the Shiite dynasty of Idrisids set up a state from Fez in Morocco, while a family of governors under the Abbasids became increasingly independent until they founded the Aghlabid Emirate from the 830s. Al Mutazm started the downward slide by utilizing non Muslim mercenaries in his personal army. Also during this period, officers started assassinating superiors with whom they disagreed, in particular the caliphs. By the 870s, Egypt became autonomous under Ahmad ibn Tulun. In the east as well, governors decreased their ties to the center. The Seferids of Herat and the Samanids of Bukhara had broken away from the 870s, cultivating a much more Persianate culture and statecraft. By this time only the central lands of Mesopotamia were under direct Abbasid control, with Palestine and the Hiyas often managed by the Tulunids. Byzantium, for its part, had begun to push Arab Muslims farther east in Anatolia. By the 920s, the situation had changed further, as North Africa was lost to the Abbasids. A Shiite sect only recognizing the first five Imams and tracing its roots to Muhammad's daughter Fatima took control of Idrisi and then Aglabid domains. Called the Fatimid dynasty, they had advanced to Egypt in 969, establishing their capital near Fustat in Cairo, which they built as a bastion of Shiite learning and politics. By 1000 they had become the chief political and ideological challenge to Sunni Islam in the form of the Abbasids. By this time the latter state had fragmented into several governorships that, while recognizing caliphal authority from Baghdad, did mostly as they wanted, fighting with each other. The caliph himself was under protection of the Bayad emirs who possessed all of Iraq and western Iran, and were quietly Shiite in their sympathies. 
Outside Iraq, all the autonomous provinces slowly took on the characteristic of de facto states with hereditary rulers, armies, and revenues and operated under only nominal caliph suzerainty, which may not necessarily be reflected by any contribution to the treasury, such as the Sumro emirs that had gained control of Sindh and ruled the entire province from their capital of Mansura. Mahmud of Ghazni took the title of Sultan, as opposed to the Amir that had been in more common usage, signifying the Ghaznavid Empire's independence from caliphal authority, despite Mahmud's ostentatious displays of Sunni orthodoxy and ritual submission to the caliph. In the 11th century, the loss of respect for the caliphs continued, as some Islamic rulers no longer mentioned the caliph's name in the Friday Qutbah, or struck it off their coinage. The Ismaili Fatimid dynasty of Cairo contested the Abbasids for even the titular authority of the Islamic Ummah. They commanded some support in the Shia sections of Baghdad such as Kark, although Baghdad was the city most closely connected to the Caliphate, even in the Bayad and Seljuk eras. The Fatimids' green banners contrasted with Abbasids' black, and the challenge of the Fatimids only ended with their downfall in the 12th century. <laughs> Bayad and Seljuk military control Despite the power of the Bayad emirs, the Abbasids retained a highly ritualized court in Baghdad, as described by the Bayad bureaucrat Halal al-Sabi, and they retained a certain influence over Baghdad as well as religious life. As Bayad power waned after the death of Baha al-Dallah, the caliphate was able to regain some measure of strength. The caliph al-Qadir, for example, led the ideological struggle against the Shia with writings such as the Baghdad Manifesto. The caliphs kept order in Baghdad itself, attempting to prevent the outbreak of fitnas in the capital, often contending with the Ayyarun. With the Bayad dynasty on the wane, a vacuum was created that was eventually filled by the dynasty of Oghuz Turks known as the Seljuks. By 1055, the Seljuks had wrested control from the Bayads and Abbasids, and took any remaining temporal power. When the emir and former slave Basasiri took up the Shia Fatimid banner in Baghdad in, the caliph al-Qa'im was unable to defeat him without outside help. Tagril Beg, the Seljuk sultan, restored Baghdad to Sunni rule and took Iraq for his dynasty. Once again, the Abbasids were forced to deal with a military power that they could not match, though the Abbasid caliph remained the titular head of the Islamic community. The succeeding sultans Alp Arslan and Maliksha, as well as their vizier Nizam al-Mulk, took up residence in Persia, but held power over the Abbasids in Baghdad. When the dynasty began to weaken in the 12th century, the Abbasids gained greater independence once again. <laughs> Revival of military strength 1118 While the Caliph al-Mustarshid was the first Caliph to build an army capable of meeting a Seljuk army in battle, he was nonetheless defeated in 1135 and assassinated. The Caliph al-Muqtafi was the first Abbasid Caliph to regain the full military independence of the Caliphate, with the help of his vizier Ibn Hubayra. After nearly 250 years of subjection to foreign dynasties, he successfully defended Baghdad against the Seljuks in the Siege of Baghdad 1157, thus securing Iraq for the Abbasids. The reign of al-Nasir brought the caliphate back into power throughout Iraq, based in large part on the Sufi Futuwa organizations that the caliph headed. Al Mustansir built the Mustansiriya school, in an attempt to eclipse the Seljuk era Nizamiya built by Nizam al-Mulk. Topic. Mongol invasion 1206 In 1206, Genghis Khan established a powerful dynasty among the Mongols of Central Asia. During the 13th century, this Mongol empire conquered most of the Eurasian land mass, including both China in the east and much of the old Islamic Caliphate as well as Kievan Rus in the west. Hulagu Khan's destruction of Baghdad in 1258 is traditionally seen as the approximate end of the Golden Age. Mongols feared that a supernatural disaster would strike if the blood of al-Mustasim, a direct descendant of Muhammad's uncle al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib, and the last reigning Abbasid caliph in Baghdad, was spilled. The Shiites of Persia stated that no such calamity had happened after the death of Husayn ibn Ali in the Battle of Kerbala. Nevertheless, as a precaution and in accordance with a Mongol taboo which forbade spilling royal blood, Hulagu had al Mustasim wrapped in a carpet and trampled to death by horses on 20 February 1258. 
The caliph's immediate family was also executed, with the lone exceptions of his youngest son who was sent to Mongolia, and a daughter who became a slave in the harem of Hulagu. <laughs> Abbasid Caliphate of Cairo 1261 In the 9th century, the Abbasids created an army loyal only to their caliphate, composed of non-Arab origin people, known as Mamluks. This force, created in the reign of al-Mamun and his brother and successor al-Mutazm prevented the further disintegration of the empire. The Mamluk army, though often viewed negatively, both helped and hurt the caliphate. Early on, it provided the government with a stable force to address domestic and foreign problems. However, creation of this foreign army and al mutasims transfer of the capital from Baghdad to Samarra created a division between the caliphate and the peoples they claimed to rule. In addition, the power of the Mamluks steadily grew until al Radi was constrained to hand over most of the royal functions to Muhammad ibn Raik. The Mamluks eventually came to power in Egypt. In 1261, following the devastation of Baghdad by the Mongols, the Mamluk rulers of Egypt re-established the Abbasid Caliphate in Cairo. The first Abbasid Caliph of Cairo was al-Mustansir. The Abbasid Caliphs in Egypt continued to maintain the presence of authority, but it was confined to religious matters. The Abbasid Caliphate of Cairo lasted until the time of al-Mutawakal III, who was taken away as a prisoner by Selim I to Constantinople where he had a ceremonial role. He died in 1543, following his return to Cairo. Culture Islamic Golden Age The Abbasid historical period lasting to the Mongol conquest of Baghdad in 1258 CE is considered the Islamic Golden Age. The Islamic Golden Age was inaugurated by the middle of the 8th century by the ascension of the Abbasid Caliphate and the transfer of the capital from Damascus to Baghdad. The Abbasids were influenced by the Quranic injunctions and hadith such as, "...the ink of a scholar is more holy than the blood of a martyr," stressing the value of knowledge. During this period the Muslim world became an intellectual center for science, philosophy, medicine and education as the Abbasids championed the cause of knowledge and established the House of Wisdom in Baghdad, where both Muslim and non-Muslim scholars sought to translate and gather all the world's knowledge into Arabic. Many classic works of antiquity that would otherwise have been lost were translated into Arabic and Persian and later in turn translated into Turkish, Hebrew and Latin. During this period the Muslim world was a cauldron of cultures which collected, synthesized and significantly advanced the knowledge gained from the ancient Roman, Chinese, Indian, Persian, Egyptian, North African, Greek and Byzantine civilizations. In virtually every field of endeavor—in astronomy, alchemy, mathematics, medicine, optics and so forth—the caliphate's scientists were in the forefront of scientific advance. Science The reigns of Harun al-Rashid and his successors fostered an age of great intellectual achievement. In large part, this was the result of the schismatic forces that had undermined the Umayyad regime, which relied on the assertion of the superiority of Arab culture as part of its claim to legitimacy, and the Abbasids' welcoming of support from non-Arab Muslims. It is well established that the Abbasid caliphs modeled their administration on that of the Sassanids. Harun al-Rashid's son, al-Mamun, whose mother was Persian, is even quoted as saying, The Persians ruled for a thousand years and did not need us Arabs even for a day. We have been ruling them for one or two centuries and cannot do without them for an hour. A number of medieval thinkers and scientists living under Islamic rule played a role in transmitting Islamic science to the Christian West. In addition, the period saw the recovery of much of the Alexandrian mathematical, geometric and astronomical knowledge, such as that of Euclid and Claudius Ptolemy. These recovered mathematical methods were later enhanced and developed by other Islamic scholars, notably by Persian scientists Al-Biruni and Abu Nasser Mansur. Christians particularly Nestorian Christians contributed to the Arab Islamic civilization during the Umayyads and the Abbasids by translating works of Greek philosophers to Syriac and afterwards to Arabic. 
Nestorians played a prominent role in the formation of Arab culture, with the Jundishapir school being prominent in the late Sassanid, Umayyad and early Abbasid periods. Notably, eight generations of the Nestorian Bukhtishu family served as private doctors to caliphs and sultans between the 8th and 11th centuries. Algebra was significantly developed by Persian scientist Muhammad ibn Musa al Khwarizmi during this time in his landmark text, Kitab al Jab wa al Muqabala, from which the term algebra is derived. He is thus considered to be the father of algebra by some, although the Greek mathematician Diophantus has also been given this title. The terms algorithm and algorithm are derived from the name of al Khwarizmi, who was also responsible for introducing the Arabic numerals and Hindu Arabic numeral system beyond the Indian subcontinent. Arab scientist Ibn al Haytham al developed an early scientific method in his Book of Optics. 1021. The most important development of the scientific method was the use of experiments to distinguish between competing scientific theories set within a generally empirical orientation, which began among Muslim scientists. Ibn al-Haytham's empirical proof of the intromission theory of light that is, that light rays entered the eyes rather than being emitted by them was particularly important. Alhazen was significant in the history of scientific method, particularly in his approach to experimentation, and has been referred to as the world's first true scientist." Medicine in medieval Islam was an area of science that advanced particularly during the Abbasids' reign. During the 9th century, Baghdad contained over 800 doctors, and great discoveries in the understanding of anatomy and diseases were made. The clinical distinction between measles and smallpox was described during this time. Famous Persian scientist Ibn Sina known to the West as Avicenna produced treatises and works that summarized the vast amount of knowledge that scientists had accumulated, and was very influential through his encyclopedias, the Canon of Medicine and the Book of Healing. The work of him and many others directly influenced the research of European scientists during the Renaissance. Astronomy in medieval Islam was advanced by al-Batani, who improved the precision of the measurement of the precession of the Earth's axis. The corrections made to the geocentric model by al-Batani, Averroes, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, Moayyajuddin Erdi and Ibn al-Shatir were later incorporated into the Copernican heliocentric model. The astrolabe, though originally developed by the Greeks, was developed further by Islamic astronomers and engineers, and subsequently brought to medieval Europe. Muslim alchemists influenced medieval European alchemists, particularly the writings attributed to Habir ibn Hayyan a number of chemical processes such as distillation techniques were developed in the Muslim world and then spread to Europe. Topic: <inaudible> Literature. <inaudible> the best known fiction from the Islamic world is the Book of 1000 and One Nights, a collection of fantastical folk tales, legends and parables compiled primarily during the Abbasid era. The collection is recorded as having originated from an Arabic translation of a Sasanian era Persian prototype, with likely origins in Indian literary traditions. Stories from Arabic, Persian, Mesopotamian, and Egyptian folklore and literature were later incorporated. The epic is believed to have taken shape in the 10th century and reached its final form by the 14th century. The number and type of tales have varied from one manuscript to another. All Arabian fantasy tales were often called Arabian Nights", when translated into English, regardless of whether they appeared in the Book of One Thousand and One Nights. This epic has been influential in the West since it was translated in the 18th century, first by Antoine Galland. Many imitations were written, especially in France. Various characters from this epic have themselves become cultural icons in Western culture, such as Aladdin, Sinbad and Ali Baba. A famous example of Islamic poetry on romance was Layla and Majnun, an originally Arabic story which was further developed by Iranian, Azerbaijani and other poets in Persian, Azerbaijani, Turkish languages. It is a tragic story of undying love much like the later Romeo and Juliet. Arabic poetry reached its greatest height in the Abbasid era, especially before the loss of central authority and the rise of the Persianate dynasties. Writers like Abu Tamim and Abu Nuwas were closely connected to the caliphal court in Baghdad during the early 9th century, while others such as al-Mutanabi received their patronage from regional courts. Philosophy One of the common definitions for «Islamic philosophy» is «the style of philosophy produced within the framework of Islamic culture». 
Islamic philosophy, in this definition is neither necessarily concerned with religious issues, nor is exclusively produced by Muslims. Their works on Aristotle was a key step in the transmission of learning from ancient Greeks to the Islamic world in the West. They often corrected the philosopher, encouraging a lively debate in the spirit of Ithihad. They also wrote influential original philosophical works, and their thinking was incorporated into Christian philosophy during the Middle Ages, notably by Thomas Aquinas. Three speculative thinkers, Al Kindi, Al Farabi, and Avicenna, combined Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism with other ideas introduced through Islam, and Avicennism was later established as a result. Other influential Abbasid philosophers include Al Jahiz, and Ibn al Haytham. Al -Hassan. Topic. Architecture As the power shifted from the Umayyads to the Abbasids, the architecture styles changed also. The Christian styles evolved into a style based more on the Sasanian Empire utilizing mud bricks and baked bricks with carved stucco. Another major development was the creation or vast enlargement of cities as they were turned into the capital of the empire. First, starting with the creation of Baghdad, starting in 762, which was planned as a walled city with a mosque and palace in the center. The walls were to have four gates to exit the city. Al-Mansur, who was responsible for the creation of Baghdad, also planned the city of Raqqa, along the Euphrates. Finally, in 836, Al-Mutazm moved the capital to a new site that he created along the Tigris, called Samarra. This city saw 60 years of work, with race courses and game preserves to add to the atmosphere. Due to the dry remote nature of the environment, some of the palaces built in this era were isolated havens. al uqaidir Fortress is a fine example of this type of building which has stables, living quarters, and a mosque, all surrounding inner courtyards. Other mosques of this era, such as the Mosque of Ibn Tulan, in Cairo, and the Great Mosque of Kairouan in Tunisia while ultimately built during the Umayyad dynasty, it was substantially renovated in the 9th century. This renovation was so extensive as to ostensibly be a rebuild, was in the furthest reaches of the Muslim world, in an area that the Aghlabids controlled, however the styles utilized were mainly of the Abbasids. Mesopotamia only has one surviving mausoleum from this era, in Samarra. This octagonal dome is the final resting place of Al-Muntasir. Other architectural innovations and styles were few, such as the four-centered arch, and a dome erected on squinches. Unfortunately, much was lost due to the ephemeral nature of the stucco and luster tiles. <laughs> Glass and crystal The Near East has, since Roman times, been recognized as a center of quality glassware and crystal. 9th century finds from Samara show styles similar to Sasanian forms. The types of objects made were bottles, flasks, vases, and cups utilized for domestic use. Decorations on these domestic items include molded flutes, honeycomb patterns, and inscriptions. Other styles seen that may not have come from the Sasanians were stamped items. These were typically round stamps, such as medallions or discs with animals, birds, or Kufic inscriptions. Colored lead glass, typically blue or green, have been found in Nishapur, along with prismatic perfume bottles. Finally, cut glass may have been the high point of Abbasid glass working, decorated with floral and animal designs. Topic. Painting Early Abbasid painting has not survived in great quantities, and sometimes harder to differentiate, however Samara is a good example as it was built by the Abbasids and abandoned 56 years later. The walls of the principal rooms of the palace that has been excavated show wall paintings and lively carved stucco dados. The style is obviously adopted with little variation from Sasanian art, as not only the styles is similar with harems, animals, and dancing people, all enclosed in scrollwork, but also the garments are Persian. Nishapur had its own school of painting. Excavations at Nishapur show artwork both monochrome and polychrome from the 8th and 9th centuries. One famous piece of art consists of hunting nobles with falcons and on horseback, in full regalia. The clothing identifies him as Tahirid, which was again, a sub dynasty of the Abbasids. Other styles are a vegetation, and fruit in nice colors on a four foot high dado. Pottery Whereas painting and architecture were not areas of strength for the Abbasid dynasty, pottery was a different story. 
The Islamic culture as a whole and the Abbasids, in particular, were at the forefront of new ideas and techniques. Some examples of their work were pieces engraved with decorations and then colored with yellow-brown, green, and purple glazes. Designs were diverse with geometric patterns, Kufic lettering, arabesque scrollwork, along with rosettes, animals, birds, and humans. Abbasid pottery from the 8th and 9th centuries have been found throughout the region, as far as Cairo. These were generally made with a yellow clay and fired multiple times with separate glazes to produce metallic luster in shades of gold, brown, or red. By the 9th century, the potters had mastered their techniques and their decorative designs could be divided into two styles. The Persian style would show animals, birds, humans, along with Kufic lettering in gold. Pieces excavated from Samara exceed in vibrancy and beauty any from later periods. These predominantly being made for the caliph's use. Tiles were also made utilizing this same technique to create both monochromic and polychromic luster tiles. Topic. Textiles Egypt being a center of the textile industry was part of the Abbasid cultural advancement. Copts were employed in the textile industry and produced linens and silks. Tinis was famous for its factories and had over 5,000 looms. Kassab, a fine linen for turbans and badana for garments of the upper class to name a couple. In a town named Tuna near Tinis, was made the Kiswa for the Kaaba in Mecca. Fine silk was also made in Dabak and Damietta. Of particular interest is the stamped and inscribed fabrics. Not only did they utilize inks but also liquid gold. Some of the finer pieces were colored in such a manner as to require six separate stamps to achieve the proper design and color. This technology spread to Europe eventually. Topic. Technology In technology, the Abbasids adopted papermaking from China. The use of paper spread from China into the Caliphate in the 8th century CE, arriving in Al-Andalus and then the rest of Europe in the 10th century. It was easier to manufacture than parchment, less likely to crack than papyrus, and could absorb ink, making it ideal for making records and making copies of the Quran. Islamic paper makers devised assembly line methods of hand copying manuscripts to turn out editions far larger than any available in Europe for centuries. It was from the Abbasids that the rest of the world learned to make paper from linen. The knowledge of gunpowder was also transmitted from China via the Caliphate, where the formulas for pure potassium nitrate and an explosive gunpowder effect were first developed. Advances were made in irrigation and farming, using new technology such as the windmill. Crops such as almonds and citrus fruit were brought to Europe through Al-Andalus, and sugar cultivation was gradually adopted by the Europeans. Apart from the Nile, Tigris and Euphrates, navigable rivers were uncommon, so transport by sea was very important. Navigational sciences were highly developed, making use of a rudimentary sextant known as a kamal. When combined with detailed maps of the period, sailors were able to sail across oceans rather than skirt along the coast. Abbasid sailors were also responsible for reintroducing large three-masted merchant vessels to the Mediterranean. The name Caravel may derive from an earlier Arab ship known as the Carib. Arab merchants dominated trade in the Indian Ocean until the arrival of the Portuguese in the 16th century. Hormuz was an important center for this trade. There was also a dense network of trade routes in the Mediterranean, along which Muslim countries traded with each other and with European powers such as Venice, Genoa and Catalonia. The Silk Road crossing Central Asia passed through Abbasid Caliphate between China and Europe. Engineers in the Abbasid Caliphate made a number of innovative industrial uses of hydropower, and early industrial uses of tidal power, wind power, and petroleum notably by distillation into kerosene. The industrial uses of watermills in the Islamic world date back to the 7th century, while horizontal wheeled and vertical wheeled water mills were both in widespread use since at least the 9th century. By the time of the Crusades, every province throughout the Islamic world had mills in operation, from Al-Andalus and North Africa to the Middle East and Central Asia. These mills performed a variety of agricultural and industrial tasks. Abbasid engineers also developed machines such as pumps incorporating crankshafts, employed gears in mills and water-raising machines, and used dams to provide additional power to watermills and water-raising machines. 
Such advances made it possible for many industrial tasks that were previously driven by manual labor in ancient times to be mechanized and driven by machinery instead in the medieval Islamic world. It has been argued that the industrial use of waterpower had spread from Islamic to Christian Spain, where fulling mills, paper mills, and forge mills were recorded for the first time in Catalonia. A number of industries were generated during the Arab Agricultural Revolution, including early industries for textiles, sugar, rope making, matting, silk, and paper. Latin translations of the 12th century passed on knowledge of chemistry and instrument making in particular. The agricultural and handicraft industries also experienced high levels of growth during this period. Topic. Status of women In contrast to the earlier era, women in Abbasid society were absent from all arenas of the community's central affairs. While their Muslim forebearers led men into battle, started rebellions, and played an active role in community life, as demonstrated in the Hadith literature, Abbasid women were ideally kept in seclusion. Conquests had brought enormous wealth and large numbers of slaves to the Muslim elite. The majority of the slaves were women and children, many of whom had been dependents or harem members of the defeated Sasanian upper classes. In the wake of the conquests an elite man could potentially own a thousand slaves, and ordinary soldiers could have ten people serving them. Nabiya Abbott, preeminent historian of elite women of the Abbasid Caliphate, describes the lives of harem women as follows. The choicest women were imprisoned behind heavy curtains and locked doors, the strings and keys of which were entrusted into the hands of that pitiable creature, the eunuch. As the size of the harem grew, men indulged to satiety. Satiety within the individual harem meant boredom for the one man and neglect for the many women. Under these conditions, satisfaction by perverse and unnatural means crept into society, particularly in its upper classes. The marketing of human beings, particularly women, as objects for sexual use meant that elite men owned the vast majority of women they interacted with, and related to them as would masters to slaves. Being a slave meant relative lack of autonomy during this time period, and belonging to a harem caused a wife and her children to have little insurance of stability and continued support due to the volatile politics of harem life. Elite men expressed in literature the horror they felt for the humiliation and degradation of their daughters and female relatives. For example, the verses addressed to Hassan ibn al-Farat on the death of his daughter read, To Abu Hassan I offer condolences. At times of disaster and catastrophe, God multiplies rewards for the patient. To be patient in misery is equivalent to giving thanks for a gift. Among the blessings of God undoubtedly is the preservation of sons and the death of daughters. Even so, courtesans and princesses produced prestigious and important poetry. Enough survives to give us access to women's historical experiences, and reveal some vivacious and powerful figures, such as the Sufi mystic Rabia al Adwaya, the princess and poet Yulaya bint al Mahdi, and the singing girls Sharia, c. 815 Fadl Ash 871 CE and Arib al Maimuniyah 797 to 890 CE. Topic: Military. In Baghdad, there were many Abbasid military leaders who were or said they were of Arab descent. However, it is clear that most of the ranks were of Iranian origin, the vast majority being from Khorasan and Transoxania, not from western Iran or Azerbaijan, with most of the Khorasani soldiers who brought the Abbasids to power were Arabs. The standing army of the Muslims in Khorasan was overwhelmingly Arab. The unit organization of the Abbasids was designed with the goal of ethnic and racial equality among supporters. When Abu Muslim recruited officers along the Silk Road, he registered them based not on their tribal or ethno-national affiliations but on their current places of residence. <inaudible> Arabization While the Abbasids originally gained power by exploiting the social inequalities against non-Arabs in the Umayyad Empire, ironically during Abbasid rule the empire rapidly Arabized. As knowledge was shared in the Arabic language throughout the empire, people of different nationalities and religions began to speak Arabic in their everyday lives. 
Resources from other languages began to be translated into Arabic, and a unique Islamic identity began to form that fused previous cultures with Arab culture, creating a level of civilization and knowledge that was considered a marvel in Europe. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Decline of the Empire. Abbasids found themselves at odds with the Shia Muslims, most of whom had supported their war against the Umayyads, since the Abbasids and the Shias claimed legitimacy by their familial connection to Prophet Muhammad. Once in power, the Abbasids embraced Sunni Islam and disavowed any support for Shia beliefs. Shortly thereafter, Berber Qarijites set up an independent state in North Africa in 801. Within 50 years the Idrisids in the Maghreb and Aglabids of Ifriqiya and a little later the Tulunids and Ikshidids of Misr were effectively independent in Africa. The Abbasid authority began to deteriorate during the reign of al-Radi when their Turkic army generals, who already had de facto independence, stopped paying the caliphate. Even provinces close to Baghdad began to seek local dynastic rule. Also, the Abbasids found themselves to often be at conflict with the Umayyads in Spain. The Abbasid financial position weakened as well, with tax revenues from the Sawad decreasing in the 9th and 10th centuries. <inaudible> <inaudible> Separatist dynasties and their successors The Abbasid Caliphate differed from others in that it did not have the same borders and extent as Islam, particularly, in the west of the Caliphate, there were multiple smaller caliphates that existed in relative peace with them. This list represents the succession of Islamic dynasties that emerged from the fractured Abbasid Empire by their general geographic location. Dynasties often overlap, where a vassal emir revolted from and later conquered his lord. Gaps appear during periods of contest where the dominating power was unclear. Except for the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt, recognizing a Shiite succession through Ali, and the Andalusian Caliphates of the Umayyads and Almohads, every Muslim dynasty at least acknowledged the nominal suzerainty of the Abbasids as Caliph and Commander of the Faithful. Northwest Africa, Idrisids (788–974), Almoravids (1040–1147), Almohads (1120–1269). Ifriqiya, modern Tunisia, eastern Algeria and western Libya, Aglabids 800 to 909 CE, Fatimids of Egypt 909 to 973 CE, Zurids 973 1148, Almohads 1148 to 1229, Hafsids 1229 to 1574. Egypt and Palestine, Tulunids (868–905 CE), Ikhshidids (935–969), Fatimid Caliphate (909–1171), Ayyubid Dynasty (1171–1250), Mamluks (1250–1517). Al Jazeera, modern Syria and northern Iraq, Hamdanids 890-1004 CE, Marwanids 990-1085, and Euclids 990-1096, Seljuks 1034-1194, Mongol Empire and the Ilkhanate 1231-1335. Southwest Iran, Bayids 934-1055, Seljuks 1034-1194, Mongol Empire Khorasan, modern Iran, Afghanistan and Turkmenistan, Tahirids 821 to 873, Safarids 873 to 903, Samanids 903 to 995, Ghaznavids 995-1038, Seljuks 1038 to 1194, Ghurids 1011 to 1215, Khwarezmians 1077 to 1231, Mongol Empire and the Ilkhanate 1231 to 1335. Transoxiana, modern Central Asia, Samanids 819 to 999, Karakhanids 840-1212, Khwarezmians 1077 to 1231, Mongol Empire and the Chagatai Khanate 1225 to 1687. Topic: Abbasid Khanate of Bastak. In 656 A, 1258 CE, the year of the fall of Baghdad, and following the sack of the city, a few surviving members of the Abbasid dynastic family led by the eldest amongst them, Ismail II son of Hamza son of Ahmed son of Muhammad, made their way into the region of Fars in southern Persia, they settled in the city of Konj, then a great center for learning and scholarship. Sheikh Abdulsalam Khanji b. 661 A, d. 
746 AH son of Abbas son of Ismail II was born in Konj only five years after the fall of Baghdad and the arrival of his grandfather in the city. He became a great religious scholar and Sufi saint, held in high esteem by the local populace. His tomb still stands in Konj and is a site visited by people from near and far. The descendants of Sheikh Abdul Salam Kanji were religious scholars and figures of great respect and repute for generation after generation. One such scholar and direct descendant of Sheikh Abdul Salam Kanji in the male line, Sheikh Muhammad d. around 905 AH son of Sheikh Jaber son of Sheikh Ismail IV, moved to Bastik. His grandson, Sheikh Muhammad the Elder d. 950 or 975 AH son of Sheikh Nasser al-Din Ahmed son of Sheikh Muhammad, settled in Konj for a time. But in 938 AH, in response to growing Safavid power, Sheikh Muhammad the Elder moved permanently to Bastik as his grandfather had done. His own grandson, Sheikh Hassan d. 1084 AH also called Mullah Hassan son of Sheikh Muhammad the younger son of Sheikh Muhammad the elder, is the common ancestor of all the Abbasids of Bastik and its neighboring areas, Sheikh Hassan's grandsons, Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid b. 1096 AH d. 1152 AH and Sheikh Muhammad Khan b. 1113 AH d. 1197 AH son of Sheikh Abdulkader son of Sheikh Hassan, became the first two Abbasid rulers of the region. In 1137 AH, Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid began gathering support for an armed force. Following the capture of Lar, he ruled the city and its dependencies for 12 or 14 years before dying in 1152 AH. Sheikh Muhammad Khan Bastaki, his brother, was meanwhile the ruler of Bastik and the region of Jahangiriya. In 1161 AH, Sheikh Muhammad Khan Bastaki departed for Didebin Fortress, leaving Bastik and its dependencies in the hands of his eldest son Sheikh Muhammad Sadiq and his cousin Aga Hassan Khan son of Mullah Ismail. Sheikh Muhammad Khan ruled Jahangiriya from Didebin Fortress for a period of roughly 20 to 24 years, for which reason he has been referred to as Sheikh Muhammad Didebin. He eventually returned to Bastik and continued to reign from there up to the time of his death. At the height of his rule, the Khanate of Bastik included not only the region of Jahangiriya, but its power also extended to Lar and Bundar Abbas as well as their dependencies, not to mention several islands in the Persian Gulf. Sheikh Muhammad Khan Bastaki was the first Abbasid ruler of Bastik to hold the title of Khan, Persian, Khan Arabic, al Hakam meaning ruler or king, which was bestowed upon him by Karim Khan Zand. The title then became that of all the subsequent Abbasid rulers of Bastik and Jahangiriya, and also collectively refers in plural form, i.e., Khans, Persian, Khwanan to the descendants of Sheikh Muhammad Khan Bastaki. The last Abbasid ruler of Bastik and Jahangiriya was Muhammad Azam Khan Banyabasi and son of Muhammad Reza Khan, Satvat al Mamalak, Banyabasi. He authored the book Tariq e Jahangiriya v a Banyabasian e Bastik, in which is recounted the history of the region and the Abbasid family that ruled it. Muhammad Azam Khan Banyabasian died in 1967, a year regarded as marking the end of the Abbasid reign in Bastik. See also List of Abbasid caliphs Category – Abbasid governors List of Sunni Muslim dynasties Iranian intermezzo Footnotes References Bibliography External links Abbasides, the New International Encyclopedia, 1905. Abbasid Caliphs. Streaming Real Audio, In Our Time, UK, BBC Radio 4, 2 February 2006. Abbasid Caliphate. Encyclopedia Iranica. Entry. Abbasids. Judaica, Jewish Virtual Library. The Abbasid Caliphate. History, Jewish Virtual Library.